Hi folks, we bought an Okamoto ACC 1224 SA1 surface grinder. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about what we bought, why we bought it, why I didn't think we'd ever buy a surface grinder, uh, and hopefully just share some of the experiences that we found in, in doing some research into what the offerings are in the market to help give you some guidance on a topic that I don't think just gets covered nearly as much uh, as a lot of the other world of manufacturing these days on things like CNC machines and 3D printers and so forth. So first things first, what did we buy? It is a pretty simple 12 inch in Y, 24 inch in X, I'll come back to that, uh, surface grinder. So it is able to grind flat parts really flat. Um, what we learned when we were kind of exploring the marketplace, because there are a number of folks uh, that make these grinders, is that there's three tiers amongst most of the major manufacturers. And the, their, their naming and nomenclature is terrible. It is semi-automatic, automatic, and fully automatic. And obviously, do your own research for your application. What I found true across most of the manufacturers is that semi-automatic doesn't have the screen. Um, it does have what I call sort of power feed. So you're not gonna be like the old school days with a little Herrig. You're not gonna be turning cranks to grind or move your ax. It, it has that power feed, but it has no other level of intelligence. You kind of just control it with some buttons. I shouldn't say no other level of intelligence. There might be some manual down feed click options but there's not what ours has, which is the middle tier, what's called an automatic grinder. And the reason I really like this as a step up is it has just ever so slight hints or fringes or tinges of CNC. It's not a CNC grinder, that's the third tier, but what this can do that was an absolute must for us is it can do automatic dressing. So you can come over here to this screen and you can tell it your part is at, you know, let's say our part's currently at two inches, we wanna grind, 10 thou off, we wanna grind that off in one thou passes, and then when we grind nine thou off and we have one thou left, we're gonna start doing two tenths passes, but before we start that, it's actually gonna lift the whole head up, move over and come down and redress the wheel on our table dresser. Uh, this machine also comes with an overhead dresser, but we wanted the more um, accurate or more thermally bulletproof table dresser options. Uh, so it can redress the wheel and then it can run different kind of feeds and speeds for the finishing pass as well as do spark outs. So that automatic dressing thing was an absolute must for me. We've had some uh, surface grinders in the past and to dress it, you had to manually come over and, and do that motion. And what's crazier was you didn't, you had to then recomp for how much you did. This handles it all. If you say in your dressing cycle code that every time it dresses, I wanna dress one thousandth of an inch off of that wheel, it knows to compensate your tool length, if you will. I think of this like a machinist. Um, but your wheel diameter by that amount, and it's proven to be quite good at that. The next step up from there is a true CNC grinder. Uh, as you can imagine, that can actually take G-code or CNC programs. So that, that could be great if you wanna reload different uh, programs for different parts or, or so forth. I didn't think I needed that. You can also do things like grind complex shapes. Say you wanna grind up to a certain distance, lift the head up, grind a different uh, datum, come back down, maybe even grind some surface profiling stuff. I didn't think I needed that either, but where I wish I would have considered that is the fact that there, and I'll come back to this, I guess, at, at the end of the video, a couple of things I don't like about the machine. Most of the settings, you know, most of the speeds and feeds and step over and RPM are programmable, except the X-axis travel here. This controls how fast your X-axis moves left to right. That's just a potentiometer knob here. And there's times when I'm doing setup or testing, I wanna slow that down. And the only way to create a process right now would be to make a note on a, like a setup sheet for a part to say, and when you run this, have the knob at you know, six o'clock or 12 o'clock. Not the end of the world, but it's a, a little bit of a lacking of an elegance, which kind of comes back to why we bought the Okamoto. I think it's one of the stronger brand name machines. Um, most of the machines that I think are stepped down from this uh, switch their country of manufacture or country of origin, which I'll let you guess what that means. But um, Okamoto's got a really strong brand. They build a really good machine. Um, this is actually built in their Thailand factory, not their Japanese factory, but um, I still think it has a very strong uh, reputation and so forth. Uh, and just to clarify, that is correct. It's Thailand, not Taiwan, um, for what it's worth. Uh, but really, um, a great machine. And for us, what we were looking for in the price point, uh, this totally made sense. Uh, price point as it sits here is in the kind of mid to high-ish five figures. So for sure a lot of money, but um, also able to do a lot. And um, that's what we needed it for. We wanted to be able to 
very, very accurately grind our puck chuck. This is our little puck chuck uh, R&D lab or lair. Uh, we do have these, they are shipping. We've got R&D units out, beta units out, et cetera. Um, but this is our zero point fixturing system. It's certainly a, a great complement if you have a Saunders machine work fixture plate. It doesn't require a Saunders machine work fixture plate though. In this instance, we only have one puck chuck which will work as well with a clocking pin. I think the more common use would be having, say, two or four of them for quick change fixturing and so forth. But we've got an air valve. This is a prototype one. They're now being anodized and lasered, but it's currently open. If we flip it there, you can see it closed. So I'll flip it back open. We could put our product in, tighten it, and it's now quite, quite, quite solid. So the task at hand for the surface grinder was we want these to be flat, accurate and consistent as between the bottom datum, so that's resting on the surface plate, and this ring right here. We'll do a full-blown video on the puck chuck later on the sort of design elements, but there's an uh, aspect of it as kind of like a dual contact with a minor amount of a flexure where the majority of this area is actually relieved. There's a tapered ring here. It's pulling down with those against this outside Z datum. So this is what set your Z height. So obviously, we want them to be all matched if you buy four of them at once. And if you buy a fifth one later, it needs to also match that same height. Obviously, a service grinder is great at doing that. We considered not getting a grinder. And this kind of comes back to why I didn't think we would actually have a grinder. I'm happy we do, by the way. And I say this very humbly, that there are a lot of grinding applications that don't need grinders anymore because of how good lots of modern CNC machines have gotten. I kind of had this hunch based on some of the work that we were doing a couple of years ago, but I say that humbly because, you know, we're proud of the parts that we make, but I am not the world's best machinist. But I thought, hey, based on how we're probing, how we're setting up tools, how we're doing our fixturing, we can get some really, really accurate parts. Uh, then I had this wonderful validating moment. I was actually uh, touring a facility uh, with a guy who is an executive at a company that makes grinders. So this is a, a guy who knows the lay of the land, the history, the industry, and so forth. And he confirmed exactly what I said. He said, the number of instances and use cases for grinders has, has fallen dramatically. It's not to say there aren't plenty left, but basically CNC machines have gotten pretty darn good. Uh, CNC machines can also be thermally instable, but so can grinders. Um, so it's not, you know, it's kind of the carpenter, not the, the hammer, if you will. But um, in this case, it, a uh, and, and so to come back to that, our Akuma, especially our horizontal and our Genos have been absolutely exquisite at the tolerances that we need to hold uh, on our fixture plates and on some of our Modvice products. That has come with a lot of hard work around process reliability, tooling, feeds and speeds. Sometimes we're probing, sometimes we're actually intentionally not probing to avoid sort of feedback loops, if you will, of, over, of correcting or overcorrecting. But all of those instances work so well because it's a single product we do still have uh, tolerance variance and height variances, but they're, they're quite minor, but they weren't acceptable for any stack up. And the, the puck chuck that you saw is two separate parts where you've got one beam machine and the second machine them stacked together. We need to grind them after they've been assembled kind of in situ to get the accuracy that we wanted and the repeatability for that product. So full stop, um, that's why we went with this machine. Um, they make smaller grinders, six by 12. They make bigger grinders, sort of 16 by 32 and so forth. We bought this size because it was kind of in that sweet spot. It was um, able to do, I think we can fit eight on here if we really wanted to. Today, we've only been doing two or three at a time. But eight should be quite uh, enough if we, even if, if Puck Chuck really takes off. And I, so I didn't want the smaller six by 12. And then a 16 by 32, actually the, kind of the old, old school Okamoto we had here for a hot second. Um, those are big machines. They, they weigh a lot more, so it's a lot more expense on rigging. Uh, and from a size standpoint, this fit quite well here. So that was kind of the natural path as well as of course the, the money side. And I've got a lot of grinding, learning slash proving things out to do before I start thinking about loading up a whole magnetic chuck full of uh, pretty expensive products and risking making uh, a lot of really bad products. So uh, we're, we're good running the smaller batches for now on this and it should be for quite some time. Like I said, we went with the Okamoto and so far have been really happy with that. Um, there are different build quality, or excuse me, build spec differences between the machines, um, even within the same builder. Ours, like many grinders, has a hydraulic uh, for X. Some machines have a ball screw for X, and I believe this machine, when it goes to a CNC, has to have that ball screw for obvious positioning reasons. Ours is kind of that dumb X motion machine. 
Um, the controls were quite different uh, between this and the, the Chevalier was the other one that we really liked. Uh, the Okamoto is kind of down here. The, the Chevalier was up here. Uh, frankly, both of the controls I think could, could use some uh, I, I hate to say it, but Industry 4.0, some modernization. There, there's quite a few things that we've had to learn on this that are tribal clunkiness. You know, it won't jog because you don't have a certain switch in the right position. Um, and we've been around machines enough to understand that that's just the lay of the land. But I think when I think about the car analogy, like Teslas or not, you kind of have somebody reinvent uh, the way these things, you interact with the car or it works and you realize, man, we don't have to have it this way um, because we've got a number of little short internal videos we made to sort of say, hey, when you're in hand jog mode and you want to jog the table over to the side, the reason it won't move is because you have this switch in the wrong position, um, stuff like that, um, to try to help us make the most of it. Um, you also get very little error reporting or feedback about why you're getting an error on the control. So um, there's no point in complaining about it more because I don't think there's anyone else doing a better job, but Daytron is another good example than Neo sort of a whole new approach of a modern control with a touch screen with more of an intelligence conversation and so forth. I'd love to see more of that in the future. The other few data points that we learned when we were doing our research and talking to folks is uh, remembering that even a new grinder and a good grinder can make bad parts if it's in the wrong environment. We're fortunate enough to have a climate controlled shop heated and air conditioned and so that really helps a lot. We still run a warm up cycle. Uh, a lot of the folks running grinders these days on social media that we've gotten to know um, are putting heaters or fish tank heaters, aquarium heaters in the coolant. Um, I think Spencer Webb had a really good data point that, uh, don't quote me on the exact data values here, but water has 10 times the energy store storage capacity as iron. So this is not intuitive to me. Um, it is takes 10 times more energy per some equivalent, I don't know, to, to get your coolant up to temperature as it does the cast iron. I always thought kind of, hey, man, you gotta warm that iron up, get it moving. Um, the other thing I've actually heard about is a shop that has space blankets wrapped around uh, certain parts of their machine just to keep it stable. Uh, and there's some pretty fun rabbit holes when you start digging into crazy grinding what people do to get that absolute, absolute precision. Because ultimately, this is still a form of a C-frame machine like a mill. You've got your base here, a column here, and then an overhang here. So you will have some amount of deviation or flex uh, as the temperature changes in the room, or the machine warms up. Uh, and that's one reason why we went with the thermal dresser is that really isolates any of that movement out versus an overhead dresser where the dresser is also bending or flexing with your column as it moves. What I don't love about it, I wish the control again were a little bit more intuitive, easier to learn, easier to avoid getting uh, stuck in spots where you're like, why won't it do what I want it to do? And some of that's just us learning and training. Um, I don't like the x-axis having a potentiometer on this style machine. I really wish it was programmable for consistency across parts. I don't like the uh, coolant splash guard or kind of lack thereof. It came with this piece of sheet metal, which would probably be okay. I know Grimsmo, Grimsmo actually has the exact same machine. When they're doing flat knives, oops, you're not going to get much splash up. And so having a lower profile splash guard will get a decent amount of your coolant. Um, that is not the case for us. We're grinding our puck chucks, which have a bit of a sidewall. When the coolant hits that, the sidewall, it splashes out over. So that's actually next week's project, which hopefully we'll have a video out soon on, showing uh, what we intended to be a third-party design, so forth. We ended up just nailing it. Uh, actually, I think it's going to be really good for pretty cheap uh, with some Amazon linear rail and a Send Cut Send acrylic to get a better version of a splash guard. It's only to stop coolant. It's not a, a, any form of a safety device other than that. And then finally, you know, the fact that this thing is automatic is wonderful. I can set it, walk away, let it run the cycles it needs to run. The one thing I wish it would do is it would give us an option to turn off the coolant or even turn off the wheel when it's done. Um, you also could consider wanting it to turn off the hydraulic system. It's not the end of the world. It actually has an amp meter. It shows you how much amps it's pulling on it. But there's been some times where I've been using it and I thought, okay, these are gonna take 20, 30 minutes to grind. I've got two hours to do something else or go to a meeting. I'll just let it finish and then sit there, but I don't really want the coolant running or the wheel turning for two hours. Um, so I wish you could auto turn that stuff off. Not the end of the world. Uh, but overall, really happy with it. The um, Obviously, prerequisite to this whole conversation was can it make really accurate parts? Uh, it can, but <laughs> having a grinder also tells you that we don't live in a perfect world. Um, part of our process has been tooling up around the metrology equipment to measure the parts with, the master gauge we're gonna be using as a reference around these uh, parts. And it tells you that, you know, 
you sit there and kind of wonder, man, when I'm grinding a, uh, the puck chuck circumference or diameter is about three and a half inches, you know, why am I seeing 30 millions of deviation around this when I just ground it on a brand new grinder? Um, sort of a side note, uh, I do know some of that is gonna come back to the full process, including the electromagnetic chuck. Uh, Robert Renzetti has talked a lot about this, as has um, Adam Demuth. Both of both you guys are very in the know on grinding about how the uh, heat and variation that those can impart or stresses can cause variations. But um, it's a pretty good day when we're talking about why we're getting a few tens of millions of variation uh, around something. Ah, one thing I forgot to mention that's worth adding in at the end here is on this machine, you can still manually move it left to right, which is helpful for setting it up. You set your left and right travel limits with these pretty nice uh, rubber coated dogs. And uh, the nice thing is they kind of align with where you want it to start and stop um, on the table. So those are pretty easy to set up. Your Y axis is in the control. Actually, excuse me, they call it a Z axis because they treat this like a horizontal machine. So your in and out though is, is set here. Some of the older machines had little dogs that you could slide over here. We also got a feature on this Okamoto called the Chuck Datum option. To be honest, it kind of blew me away that this isn't a uh, more common thing in the grinding world. But again, I come in at this as a machinist and the way we were gonna run the grinder, the majority of the time, we're gonna be grinding our puck chucks, which I think from memory are 1.93 inches. So our workflow is gonna be to set them on here and I wanna end up with a part that's 1.93 inches. And we know within about 10 thou or even less what the starting height of the material is going to be. So I don't wanna to have to do more work than that. Well, most grinders seem to come with this workflow idea of you dust off your top of your part, measure it, set that as your kind of top zero, and then go down from there, which is very much reinventing the wheel every time. Okamoto has this uh, chuck datum option. It's why our machine has this extra thing here, but it's really just a software thing where we once taught it where the top of the chuck is, and with you know caveats around long-term wear and so forth, that doesn't move. And what we can now do is, I got this part in here that is point, I gotta go into edit, 0.65, and we're just gonna end up at 0.648, just grind two thou off of it. Um, this is uh, another good example. <laughs> now that we have a grinder, we found uh, quite a few uh, how shop needs where it's been really handy to be able to get either a flat datum or a parallel datum uh, on some of our parts. And subject to setting some other variables here, we'll be good to go. So as always folks, hope you learned something, hope you enjoyed, take care, see you soon.